who brought it to us, this gift of mankind. Tonight, in a 17-part, 47-hour expose on dabbing, we will look into its history, its dangers, most importantly, how to dab. I am your host, Professor Emeritus William Dewan of Harvard, Yale, Oxford, and Millersville University. Professor of Dabbing. Let us explore its history. Throughout the ages, people have dabbed. Was it brought here by the Romans, by the Greeks, or was it brought here by an alien culture? We will look into that over the next several hours as we dive deeper into dabbing culture. So you want the 40,000 year history of the dab, correct? That is correct. Okay. Okay, so the earliest recorded history of the dab, it goes back to hunter-gatherer societies before like civilization, like you know how you would hunt, like, throw stuff at animals and kill it. Or, and this is where the dab comes in, you would gather berries, nuts, foliage, stuff like that. It was very common for people to reach out with one hand, but cover their face to prevent them from having thorns and other, like, pokey things jab you in the face. So, the hunter-gatherer society figured out that dabbing was a productive part of their hunter-gatherer tactics. You then can trace it back to ancient Egypt, where you would have all of these hieroglyphs. Believe it or not, the one symbol that when we discovered the Rosetta Stone that led to the translation of Egyptian hieroglyphs was this one symbol where it was very clearly, and you can look this up, a man dabbing. Oh, that's good. Yeah, from there, the Greeks developed dabbing because, as you know, the Greeks were very in tune with modern medicine. They decided that if you sneeze, you do need to dab cover your face with one hand, but then also move your other hand out this way in order to project the germs away from anyone that you were talking to and up into the air under the assumption that heat would grab these germs and take it up even farther away from the people in danger. The Romans also were well aware of the properties that the dab do have in warfare. During the Second Punic War, Hannibal Barca reigned over the Italian peninsula, but it wasn't until Publius Scipio Africanus, later getting the name Africanus, went into Spain and did battle with the Iberians that he was able to use the dab to its full potential. You see, Publius's father died at the hands of Hannibal at the Battle of Lake Termenescai. So he took what he learned, brought it over into Spain, did battle with his brother Hasdrubal Barca and realized that when riding horseback, if you make yourself more aerodynamic when turning, in, in fact, he said that if you have your one elbow pointed and your other hand out like this, <clears throat> you can more effectively turn on horseback. It was wild, and people used it for decades. <clears throat> the next major occurrence, <coughs> <coughs> the next major occurrence of the dab coming up happens in about 400 to 600 AD. 
when none other than Mansa Musa made his trek <clears throat> all the way from Timbuktu across most of the known world with his caravan, very famously known for all of the gold that he brought into the, at the time, modern world. What he did was he had to travel through the desert to do it. I don't know if you've ever been in a desert, but there's like sand everywhere. And it's like flying up in your face and stuff. So they utilized, uh, well, I, I really need this. Uh, that's a good quality beverage right there. Uh, Mansa Musa, they, they would dab to prevent the sand from getting into crevasses all over their bodies, but most importantly, protecting their face. The dab is what brought gold from Timbuktu over into most of the rest of the Western world. From there, the dab actually was simultaneously used on both sides of the crusade during the war. It would be a battle cry for the European crusaders, but would also be a hymn of praise to God for, uh, the, the, the household of Islam in that area. It was interesting because you would have uh, crusaders coming from Acre, like dabbing on horseback coming in, but you would also have, uh, you would have uh, was Saracens uh, also dabbing. Ironically, they did it in the opposite way to announce, I'm here for God, let's fight guys. It was very moving. In fact, when Christopher Columbus sailed across the ocean to the Americas, he thought that he was going to be bringing the dab to a whole new world. Lo and behold, the people that were already living in the Americas knew how to dab. In fact, the German word for potato is one of the few words in German. Ooh, I got crummies everywhere. Is one of the few words in German that is actually Latin de derived. The word is kartoffel, which literally means cart, like cartography of the earth, and full, which is uh, Latin for fruit. So it's earth through fruit, fruit. Yes. Uh, the way that the people living in the Americas would plant this kartoffel or potato, as you will, they would hold it between their nose and this little part of the elbow area, and then hold their shovel after they dug the hole. And then when they broke from it, they would drop the potato into the hole and grill it believe it or not. So the dab was actually a very pivotal part of the Salem witch trials as well. People that wouldn't dab were considered to be witches. They thought that this practice was just so stupid that it needed to be removed from society. But it was actually that desire to remove the dab from society that removed them from society because, you know, they were witches. Witches died. <laughs> Pretty well known fact. After the Salem witch trials, you know, you got into like the Revolutionary War era. You know, like England's like, yo, we're gonna tax you. And the US was like, why don't we just tax ourselves instead? <laughs> so we got in a war. There was this guy name like, hold on, you wrote it down and told me to say this. Uh, Nermiah Dibble, Dibble, D Dibble, he, he did the dab. He did the dab dirty during the war, and it was actually a way to repel musket shots. So if you would move your one hand out this way, you would get so much of your potential force moved into being kinetic energy that if a bullet, like I'm talking a musket ball, was coming at you, you could quickly go like this 
and it would deflect off of your elbow. You would break your elbow, but you would deflect the musket ball directly back at the person that shot it at you and kill them. He was the one that discovered that. Which brings us to the War of 1812. We decided that we were gonna fight with pirates. And pirates are very well known for just dabbing on the ocean. Like, what people normally would do if they thought that a ship that was coming up to them was a pirate vessel, they would dab at them. And if the other ship would dab back, you would know that they were pirates and they would fight you. But the pirates at one point figured this out and decided that they were going to stop dabbing. So thankfully, pirates brought on a whole new era of not dabbing. This dabbing doldrum went on for more than a century until you get into World War I, the trenches. It was believed that trench foot was caused from a lack of dabbing. Dabbing is known to provide vitamin D, not D for dab, but like vitamin D. Like, what are you, an idiot? Vitamin D deficiency is actually one of the reasons that people are so susceptible to trench foot. Not the fact that they're in a trench, but because that region of Europe is just dark all the time and you can't get any vitamin D. But if they would have been dabbing, they would have been fine. Yeah. That brings me to John. Dobbing. Not dabbing, you idiot. Dobbing. This guy, he did all kinds of research on the brain. Like, we thought that it was just this potato shaped thing in our head that, like, made us, like, feel stuff. No. He decided that the brain. Excuse me. Ah, this was on the floor. Oh. Mm. Thank you. Nourishment. Just like what John Dobbing discovered, that your body is a source of nourishment for the brain. Like, your brain needs certain things, such as dabbing. If you do not dab, that brain starts to deteriorate faster. Like, you know, you know the whole saying, like, you only use 15% of your brain. That drops 1% every year of your life that you don't dab at least once. And they don't teach this in school. Like you got kids that aren't dabbing and they're dying because their brain stops. Like, I don't want to be laying in bed one day and have my brain stop. That'd suck. He discovered it, John Dobbing, which leads me into the 1970s, the disco dabbing era. People would ask each other to dance by giving a little dab. And if they dabbed back at you, you knew that they wanted to dance with you. If they did not dab, do not dance. It's really just that simple. And it transferred directly into the Atlanta hip hop scene, believe it or not. If someone wanted you to pass them the mic, You would dab, and they would pass you the mic. But it was tricky to get the hang of it. Like, I'm going to see if you can do this. So consider this the mic. So if I were to dab, you would have to throw me the mic, and in my nose hand, I would have to try to catch it, OK? Okay. I'm going to throw this to you now. You are going to throw this to me, as an example. Okay. Huh. Do I throw it now? Okay, we'll try it again. When I, when I make the huh sound. When you make the huh sound, I throw. Yeah. Huh. I was uh, expecting the ho. Oh, okay. Let's try this again. Okay. Huh. 
and then I would get to drop some sick bars. And that's how the Atlanta hip hop scene used the dab. Mm. Yeah, so uh, this brings me to tweens. <laughs> I don't know if you've heard of Abraham Lincoln's four score and seven years ago thing, but he talks about a score which is a 20 year period. Very similar to score being a 20 week period or a 20 year period, a fortnight is a two week period, which tweens love. They love this whole fortnight thing where they can just play this game, which just has stupid shit in it. Like, pardon my words, I shouldn't call them stupid, but it is shit. And these kids, they just learned from video games, not violence, but dabbing. It had gone away because in the Atlanta hip hop scene, people were like, oh, well, the Atlanta Braves are awful, so I'm not going to pay attention to Atlanta anymore. So they just moved on from dabbing, and dabbing was forgotten. But somehow, through tween activity, dabbing has reemerged, and it is terrifying. Not so 40,000 year history of the dab. You want to know about dabbing? I've dabbled in dabbing. Barkey, another one. You've had enough already? No. Nope. Another one. You've had enough. Another already. one. You've had enough. No. Dabbing. Do I have to call the manager? You've had enough already. Proliferation of street gangs in our cities have presented a specific problem to dabbing culture. Many of these renegade youth find themselves in broken homes and difficult scenarios of their own. In fact, some of them are so against dabbing culture that even the sight of someone going for a dab will bring them out of their crevices into the streets. I see some now. Let me go dab here. Stop! I'm here with Dr. Ophelia Sierra from MIT. Uh, you have some thoughts on that and how they relate to quantum Mathematics. Mick Mathematics, yeah. Mick Mathematics. So it's, it's a new brand of mathematics. Right, right. Um, it's unfortunate this day and age that uh, McDonald's is really funding a lot of mathematical studies, but I'm loving it anyway. They are actually a tween market. Yeah, yeah. So I understand you've learned a little bit of uh, some of the concepts about dabbing. I am heavily interested in this. As you know, um, I have my article, The Mathematical Art of the Dab. Um, so I'm going to try to explain some of this to you because you need to know. Okay, so first of all, we always know that two rays together make an angle, correct? Thought so. Okay, here we go. Now there's this angle here. You gotta be really careful about how you use the same one of that. There is a precise uh, placement that you have to have between the shoulder, the elbow, and the wrist. Um, now, we probably got like a 36 and a 4 uh, tenths degree there. And um, after that, we're gonna have to review some topics um, and if you don't know how to factor this you probably won't be able to dab properly um, so yeah we we definitely
family are always teaching how to factor in our dad classes because, I mean, it makes a lot of sense. But first of all, let's go over this old, this good old topic here. Okay. In order to understand this better, we're going to have to talk about circles. Okay. We're going to have to talk about pi. All right. If you don't know about this, like, we can't, we can't, we can't make anything out of, out of what you want to be, which is a dab. And what is pi equal to? What's the exact uh, number of pi? Oh, well, we like to just uh, abbreviate it here. So um, we continue. Uh, we got three, nine, nine, three, seven, Seven, six, five, and this is like this is like a really good approximation. Um, now that you have that, don't forget it. We're going to use that to talk about these circles. Okay, so now we talk about the circumference of this circle is two pi r. So once again, we take the number two. Okay. And then we multiply it by 3.14159255893752. And okay, a 7, 3, 4. Oh, and just backtrack real quick, one sec. We got this, this R here, it's from right the center to the edge, okay? So we have to also multiply by that R. Could be just like five. Continuing here, uh, seven, eight, nine, so, nine. So when I, when I dab in my private life, four, and I, I go, I'm going down for the dab, seven, and I come in, and I swing my arm wildly, just like this. Six, I, four, up. It's like seven, four, eight, two, two. People have gotten hurt. People have died. Dabbing. It's not for amateurs, is it? No. Dabbing can only be done by professionals professional settings under extreme care. At this point, we'll take a look at physical aspects of dabbing, the therapies that people must adhere to, exercises, safety considerations, and of course, loss of limb. There are many injuries that are associated with dabbing that you want to avoid. The most common injury is a broken nose. Take this guy for example. He has slammed his nose into the crook of his elbow so many times that he no longer has a nose. That's why it's recommended to leave at least two nose lengths between your nose and the crook of the elbow to prevent this very common injury. Other injuries that occur are stiff joints especially in the extended elbow. That's why it's recommended to alternate dabs between one arm and the other. Otherwise, you could permanently get stuck in a position such as this. Back injuries are also common in frequent dabbers, for they are leaning forward so much, they wind up with a gash in their back. They lean forward so much that they actually split the skin on their back and they're unable to sit properly. Dabbing can be fun, but it's important to try to avoid these injuries. It's very easy to do so. You just have to follow the correct steps. Last but not least, it is also highly recommended to alternate legs which you dab on as well. Otherwise, you'll end up with a condition known as flamingo leg, where you can only stand on one leg for extended periods at a time while the other one stays flexed. The final, final injury that can occur with dabbing, 
as you can see right here, if you dab too much, you're going to be in a position where the only way that you can stand and support yourself is if they surgically implant a metal rod through your bum. So in order to avoid these kind of injuries, it's important to practice safe dabbing. Otherwise, you will wind up like this poor fellow right here. Faceless, noseless, stiff. You can't ignore your cardio if you hope to dab among the best of them. That's why I highly recommend the elliptical. It engages all aspects of the body that are involved in dab. But if you want bonus points, if you really want a good dab workout, switch to single leg rows. It's the elliptical. Man, I feel ready to dab. Our little friend here is going to help us understand just what kind of motions the body goes through as it dabs. As you can see, there are segments of the body. This right here is called the thinking segment. This is the fun segment. This is the ow, I'm getting older segment. This is the don't bend it too far back segment. And this is the come here segment. As we go through a dab, we start off in anatomical neutral position, just as so. We then take the head and bring it into forward flexion, thanks to our sternocleidomastoid. Our pec major, also known as our nipple muscle, brings us through horizontal adduction, allowing us to get the first part of the dab. Our elbow then flexes, thanks to the biceps brachii and the brachioradialis, bringing it across our face, shielding us as if we were sneezing. Our opposing arm then goes into shoulder extension and elbow extension, bringing out. So, so far we've completed the basic step of the dab, but for the advanced level, you also want to be sure to include some knee flexion. And just like that, our segments all align. We have ourselves a wonderful little dab. Let's focus first on that horizontal adduction action done by the primary arm. Pecs. Good way to strengthen the pecs. Chest press. Next, we got to think about the triceps on the opposing arm. Skull crushers are a great exercise for this. Next, we got to think about the triceps on the opposing arm. Skull crushers are a great exercise for this. Working the hamstrings can be done in several ways. My personal favorite is through one of the step down exercises. So you bring it down and pop it back up. Bring it down, pop it back up. This is only to be done if you're going to do the advanced level of dabbing as described earlier. Hammer curls activate the brachioradialis, the beer muscle, going up like this. It's very important to work this exercise in particular because dabbers are often frequent alcoholics. Come to the portion of the video where it's time to show you how to dab. It's very simple, quite simple. We're gonna extend one arm out and we're gonna put another arm up to our nose. Uh, we may, uh, as the mood strikes us, we may lift up a leg or we may not. That is an option that is available to you at home. So, here we go. Before I dab, I want to say thank you for watching our video today. And uh, we say hello to the aliens who discovered this. Now, 